All right, it's good to see you here. Let's take our hymn books and begin our time of worship with number 340. Near, still near, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, to the precious thou art. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in the haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Nearer, still nearer, nothing I bring. Not as an offering to Jesus, my King. Only my sinful, now contrite heart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine. Sin with its follies I gladly resign. All of its pleasure, pomp and its pride, give me but Jesus, my Lord crucify. Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucify. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last, till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Through endless ages, ever to be, Nearer, my Savior, still nearer to Thee. Nearer, my Savior, still nearer to Thee. It can't be any nearer than what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. But our desire is to have our hearts ever drawn to Him. Let's take our Bibles and look together in Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. It's going to be our scripture reading for this evening. We see God's contempt for idolatry, any sort of worship in form or fashion that is contrary to the clear, distinct way in which God declares in this word that he's to be worshipped, and that's going to be through his son alone and through his sacrifice and shed blood alone. Now, Balak had tried to hire Balaam to come curse the children of Israel. That's in the previous chapter, but every time he opened his mouth, there was nothing but blessing that came forth. Balak eventually became mad and angry at Balaam. And the scriptures tell us that Balaam put it in Balak's ear that if he wanted to draw the children of Israel aside, 
that he should start inviting them to their sacrifices and to their feasts and to their places of worship. And the people would not be able to resist. The picture is here, here's a clear desire on Balak's part to curse the people of Israel and couldn't. But now in a subtle way, he is able to draw them aside. And that's what we're reading about here, how the Israelites were enticed by the daughters of Moab and Midian because much of their practices as far as worship, just like in the New Testament in Corinth, it involved religious prostitution. There were literally prostitutes that were there to draw people in and were there for the pleasure of the people that came to worship. It's a type and picture of all types of works religion that is fleshly. And it may not be that today in these congregations, you literally have prostitutes drawing people in, but the scriptures describe false worship as prostitution. People prostituting themselves in ways of worship that they call contemporary, and yet, it is not as God has directed. And so many who profess to be the Lord's are in that way drawn aside, made to feel better about themselves. It's all about feeling. And so we see that here in Numbers 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. So this is with purpose, these, these pagan women coming over and beginning to entertain the men of Israel. And you know how relationships go. It starts very subtly. I liken it to maybe a couple that is courting and seeing each other and one will say to the other, why don't you come on over to our place of worship? And uh, it's a good time. We'll have a good time. That's how it began here. They called the people under the sacrifices of their gods, little G-O-D-S, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. It's like some today say, well, why don't you come over to our fellowship meal? What can it hurt? You, you say that you worship God and spirit and truth, but come on over here. You'll see how we worship, and it, many times it's centered around food and fellowship, they call it. That's how this all began. And it says, as a result, in verse 3, that Israel enjoined himself unto Baal Peor. That was the religion of the day amongst these. But you can see the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. You'll find that all throughout the, the scripture reading of the Old Testament. It wasn't for this sin or that. God knows us to be what we are. We're sinners by nature. He knows not just what is on the outward, but the very thoughts. But if you ask, what is it that kindles the anger of the Lord, it has to do with false worship in every case. Israel was ultimately taken into captivity and judgment because of false worship. Setting aside the one way in which God had directed that he would be worshiped, and that through the blood sacrifices, typifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people, and this sounds brutal, but this shows, again, a small picture of God's wrath against idolatry. People take lightly today their free will worship, and uh, the, the thought that somehow part of it is God, part of it's me, you want to know God's wrath against such thinking and such a way of worship? He says, take all the heads of the people. Let's talk about the leaders. And hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. God's going to require at the hands of this people the death of their leaders. As goes the leadership, so go the people. I don't care what the confession of faith is. Some say, well, we've got a pretty good confession of faith. Well, what's the man saying when he's preaching from the pulpit? 
And if he's not preaching Christ and him crucified, then Paul says, let him be anathema. Or in Galatians, that means let him be damned. Rather than continue to lead a congregation of people away from what is clearly revealed here in the word, the glory that belongs unto the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. No room for compromise. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Here's this public execution going on of every one of the heads. And there were those then realizing the danger they were in. They're weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Why there? Well, that's because now they're awake. They're alert. That's where the sacrifices were offered. That's where the high priests and the priests went in and out on behalf of the people before the door of the tabernacle. So we have these weeping, and while they're weeping, here comes one still playing. Chasing a Midianitish woman right in the camp, right in the sight of the, of the people. There's some that when God's hand of judgment is being exercised, they're so oblivious to what's going on around them because their consciences are seared. They, this is the time to play. And so we read here in verse 7, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest. So here is one of the Aaronic priesthood. When he saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent, pursued him, and thrust both of them through, the man and the woman. The man of Israel and the woman threw her belly, and so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Now it's interesting that even though Phineas was a son of Aaron, he has an interesting name. I looked it up. It actually means a serpent's mouth. So when you hear that, the sting of a serpent, you might think that that would pertain to it in an evil sense. But even in his naming, God had already foreordained what this would mean as far as exercising judgment. It's like it speaks of Christ who comes with a sword in his mouth. And in that I see Phineas as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ who was a high priest. He was the high priest. And in his hand is the power, the authority to exercise salvation or judgment. And so Phineas here is exercising that zeal for the glory and honor of the Lord, even to the point of slaying this man, this woman, as an example of God's justice against any that would take lightly how it is that God is to be worshiped. In fact, again, I see in this a type of the Lord where it's said of our Lord that the zeal of Thine house hath eaten me up, according to Psalm 69 and verse 9. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee have fallen on me. Here is Phineas, again, driven by the Spirit of God to do this to the glory and honor of the Lord and being willing to accept the reproach that this might bring. Like many would say, well, it really wasn't that bad, was it? Absolutely it was. So people today, in their free will worship, they, they're sitting there thinking, well, it can't be that bad. God would certainly never send sinners to hell for their free will worship. You don't know God. Because salvation belongs unto the Lord. And he exercises his judgment through his son. Christ prayed that in the garden. He thanked the Father that the Father had given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. Now if you don't, and this is what stayed the plague. 
This was a plague that the Lord had sent through the camp. And here's one standing in the breach. So there again, I see Phineas as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, who stood in between God's wrath and judgment on his people and, and taking that upon himself. Because it says here in verse 9 that those that died in the plague were 24,000. When you hear of something taking 24,000 lives in a day, that's serious. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, notice, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. There's a picture of Christ. How is God's wrath turned away? It's through judgment and justice rendered in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ. While he was zealous for my sake among them, you look at Christ's earthly ministry and all that he did, it was for one reason, his zeal for his father, whether in salvation or judgment. And he said that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. See, God's jealous. He's jealous of his honor. He's jealous of his righteousness. He's jealous of his glory. He's jealous of his son. Imagine if someone came up to you and said, I really like you, but I don't like your son. How long are you going to deal with that person? You just spit in that father's face. The Lord is jealous of his glory. He's jealous of how we worship. And I trust that we're mindful of that every time we come together. Without Christ, without him standing in the breach, there's nothing but God's wrath that abides. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. There again, Phineas is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the messenger of the covenant of grace. And he serves here as a type of that glory that the Father has for his Son. And by his action, by exercising justice and judgment, to save this, the rest, there's a remnant that was spared. 24,000 were destroyed. Why weren't the rest? Were they any more deserving? No, it was God who drew a line through Phineas. It says he shall have it, that is, the covenant of peace, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. An atonement means a covering. It, it was a covering until Christ should come. So whatever Phineas represented, the fulfillment of this would be in the Lord Jesus Christ through him, that seed, that God would make not just an atonement in Christ, but an actual reconciliation, justification of those for whom Christ paid the debt. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. This was a well-known man. But his position there in Israel did not spare him from judgment. Because by his actions he proved himself to be other than one of the Lord's. And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. A lot of people think, well, he's a pastor, so he must be God's man. Not necessarily. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague of Peor's sake. So how jealous is God of his honor and glory? Well, read this scripture. He doesn't tolerate anything that men devise that in any way 
gives glory to man. And it's certainly a very sobering scripture text to read. But thank God for Phineas, type of the Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest, who stood in the breach. And because of him, God's wrath is turned away from such as we are. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. And it is very somber, sobering to read. I pray that you would keep our minds and hearts stayed upon your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and see in him all your glory and honor. And uh, not to be caught up with the wiles of men and their devised means that would easily draw us aside were it not for your grace keeping us. I thank you that indeed your shed blood and that righteousness imputed is all of our righteousness whereby your wrath has been stayed against such sinners as we are. So as we continue in our worship, may our eyes ever be on your glory and that of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 35 before the message. Hymn number 35, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. Ransom healed, restored, forgiven, evermore his praises sing. Alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Father like he tends and spares us, well our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Alleluia, widely yet his mercy flows. Alleluia, widely yet his mercy flows. Angels in the height adore him, ye behold him face to face. Sun and moon bow down before him, dwellers all in time and space. Alleluia, praise with us the God of grace. Alleluia, praise with us the God of grace. All right, for our message, let's turn together to 1 Kings chapter 9. My text is from verse 1 down to verse 9. And I've entitled this, Hallowed Be God's Name. This is what our Lord taught his disciples to pray, and us, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That word hallowed means to be holy, sanctified, <coughs> honored, set apart above any name. And you can see how even in the scripture reading in Numbers 25, God hallows his own name. He'll sanctify his name, whether men will or not, and he'll cause us to know that he is God indeed. And so we see that even in Solomon's prayer here in verse 1, it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord. And remember we saw already that that took seven years. That was in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 38. And then he adds here, and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do. He actually took 13 years. You saw that in 1 Kings 7, verse 1. 13 years to build his own house and gardens and groves and everything pertaining to it. But even in that, we see that his zeal, as the Lord gave it to him, was first of all for the house of the Lord. He, that was his primary focus, get that built, and then finish his own. It says, all of Solomon's desire, which he 
was pleased to do there in verse 1 had to do with all other buildings. This was like a compound. And remember, even the house for Pharaoh's daughter, that was his first wife, that was the one that he took to wife. Again, a picture, you say, well, she was Egyptian. Well, the Lord purposed that that be the wife that he take to himself, and I believe as a foreshadowing of how our Lord Jesus Christ purposed to take to himself a bride from among the nations. It's not just Jews, but he has those sinners that were given him from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And again, his house that he had in the forest of Lebanon, whatever vineyards or gardens, this was quite a, a deal that Solomon put his hand to. Pools of water, all these made for his pleasure, in which he succeeded and prospered. In fact, if you go over to Second Chronicles chapter 7, someone asked me, well, are we going to continue on into Chronicles? Well, Chronicles is really an amplification of what we're reading here in the Kings. I liken it to the Gospels. Some say, well, why are there four Gospels? Why not just one? Well, the Lord purposed that each one be written from a different perspective. And so many times, as we're studying here in Kings, you'll find some cross-references over to First and Second Chronicles, and it helps give us an amplification of really what all these mean. That's what I love about Scripture, is comparing Scripture with Scripture. Get you a good reference Bible. Don't, don't get one with a man's notes in the bottom there. There was somebody arguing one time with me. He said, I know it's in the Bible. I know it's in the Bible. And uh, I said, well, I've never seen the Bible. And I said, I'll find it. So anyway, he found it and he brought it to me and he starts reading. And I'm looking down, there's a line. Here's the scriptures up here and here's the commentary down here. He's reading from man's commentary. And I told him, you need to go burn that Bible. Because what's important is the Word of God and not man's commentary. So that's what I like about a good cross-reference Bible that takes you from, from Scripture to Scripture. Sometimes you have to be careful even with cross-references because men put those in there and it's, it's guided to some thought that they're trying to portray. But here, for example, Second Chronicles 7, verse 11 it says, thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord. The same scripture we're reading over here in 1 Kings 9. And all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he prosperously effected. <laughs> now, if that's not a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as God's king, whereby by his spirit, everything he put his hand to, God prospered. Scriptures don't know anything of a wannabe Jesus. He'd really like to get certain things done, but alas, he can't. So everything here that he purposed to do, and God putting that purpose in his heart, he effected. I love that word effectual. Someone said, well, what does that mean? That gets the job done. And so you can see here, it's all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do. What was he pleased to do, but what the Spirit of God had put in his heart, just like our Lord Jesus Christ. He had many opposers and enemies, but none could stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? All that he pleased to do, he accomplished. And so in verse 2, it says that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time. Remember, the first time that he appeared unto him was back there in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 5, where he asked Solomon what it was that Solomon desired, and Solomon prayed for wisdom. And so that was in Gibeon, in a dream and a vision, and by night. Here again, we see that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time. This shows God's favor upon him. God doesn't just appear haphazardly. But it's as if now that the house of the, the Lord is built, this beautiful temple, it was so beautiful that even the Queen of Sheba, when she came and observed it, she said that half had not been told. 
And it doesn't surprise me that the Lord purposed that this temple should be so beautiful because it's a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, and all that pertain to it, the cloud, the Shekinah glory, just that alone. So it says, as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. I, I love these simple scriptures. A lot of times we read through them pretty quickly, but God doesn't change when it says, as he appeared unto him at Gibeon. Well, how did he appear, appear unto Solomon at Gibeon? In God's faithfulness, to strengthen him and to establish him in this work that he was to accomplish as king. It shows us that God never abandons his own. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, all that he faced in the face of the opposition and the religious people of his day, yet he was about building his church. That's what he was about, his temple. Not a physical temple, but those that the Father had given him. And so the Lord was with him. And the Lord said unto him, let's see that in verse 3, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication. Here again we see a picture of a Solomon as a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ as the intercessor, as his king, hearing his supplication on behalf of the people that thou hast made before me. And that's referring to everything we studied back there in 1 Kings chapter 8. Solomon's prayer before the Lord, asking him to bless this temple as a type and picture of his son. And here's where we get the title, Hallowed Be God's Name. Because God says, I have hallowed this house. Why did he hollow this house? Why was this particular house so distinctive from all other places of worship that other nations had? They had their temples. They had their idol gods. What's so particular about this one? Again, it was built as a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the prototype. Everything about this house pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and who he is and what he should accomplish, how through him, that mediator, God would bless a people in their way of worship. He said, I've hollowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. You say, well, there was a time that came where God destroyed that temple, then he rebuilt it. So there were gaps in history, but never with God. When it says here that I have put my name there forever, it's in how it represents his son that one who was to come and who would fulfill all righteousness, unlike these who were to fail. Even Solomon would fail. But God never took his eye off of his son, that seed that was to come from this people that here they represented. And so when God says to put my name there forever, he's forward looking to the finished product which would be the spiritual temple that Christ would come and earn and establish and build and lay that foundation. And he says, mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. I liken it to someone holding a picture of a loved one, of their son. And if you don't know the son, you might know the father, but you're not really sure what is the interest of looking in this picture? It's a representation of what the son is. Maybe that son isn't physically present there yet, but you know just by how that father is looking at that picture that, that there's an affection for that son. And that's how I see the Old Testament. We're reading the Old Testament. This is the picture. And you say, well, what, what does God see to hollow his name here? He sees his son. And what it typifies. And when that son in the fullness of the time shall come, that's where the full glory of what all this represented would be manifest. God's never taken his eye off his son. 
He's had it on him from eternity and for eternity. And everything that he's doing through history and time is for the glory and honor of his son. So he says here in verse 4, If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked. Now David was a sinful man, just like Solomon was a sinful man, right? When, when the Lord purposed that their lives be exposed for who they are as men through the scriptures, nothing hidden. Everything's transparent. We're going to see it here shortly with regard to Solomon to a point where people looking at Solomon say, well, how on earth could he ever been a Christian? How could he have ever been one of the Lords? Well, ask yourself how you could ever be one of the Lords just because your thoughts aren't exposed. We all have a heart of idolatry. We all have a flesh that's the same as the fallen flesh is Adam. But in the one thing with regard to David, his father, walking in the integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments. It's speaking with relationship to Christ and to that honor and glory due to his name. It's like the Lord said of Abraham, he saw my day and rejoiced. Whether it's David or Solomon or Moses, any one of these of the Old Testament, the integrity of the heart simply means, it doesn't mean it was a perfect heart, but it means that God had put his spirit in them to look outside of themselves for any hope. And how much more so in exposing their sin. It's against the backdrop of their sin that we see God's covenant mercies toward them such as they were, and toward us. And when it says in uprightness, that's not their own, but that's how God saw them as his elect and caused them to walk in that integrity of heart and in that uprightness, whereby they looked to him who was their uprightness. And so doing, according to all that he commanded, every command of God mentioned this before, God gave his commandments and his law for three reasons. One, that those that he revealed that law to should see his absolute holiness. And secondly, their absolute sinfulness. And then thirdly, to look outside themselves to this one who would come and who would indeed fulfill the law on their behalf. So that's what he says to Solomon here. If you will continue to walk before me in that way, verse 5, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever. As I promised to David thy father, saying, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. Again, we're going to find as we read on that this kingly line was perverted in many ways by the corruption of sin. And yet, when the Lord says, I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, it's telling us that nothing that these did could deter God from accomplishing what he had purposed all along, even through them as types and pictures, by putting a man, I love that, at the end of verse 5, a man upon the throne of Israel. Who's that man? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So in spite of their sin, in spite of their failures, and Solomon included, yet God never, again, took his eye off his son. And he purposed that that son should rule and reign. But it says here in verse 6, this doesn't excuse their sin. If ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house, and there is that word again, hallowed, 
That's the what's the study here. Hallowed be God's name. Which I have hallowed, I've sanctified, I've set apart in all of his righteous and holiness for my name. Will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. I don't know if you see it here, but there's representation. If there is one, such as Solomon, who did according to all that God commanded, and we know he did, well, but the Lord raised up another, raised up another. There was a continuous royalty all the way down until Christ should come. But we see representation. As goes the representative, so goes the people. If thou stand, and this is really no different than what God did back there in the Garden of Eden. He placed Adam there as a representative of his race. As he obeyed that one command, then so went his race. He fell, so went his race. And that's just another picture of representation here. If we don't have that representative, which we do in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of these had to fail. Some people say, well, why did God purpose the fall? Well, because before time, there was already that last Adam that God had purposed to exalt, and that was his son. It's against the backdrop of that fall that we see the glory of God's grace and raising up a seed. The seed of the woman. But any that do not stand, as Adam did, he fell. Then all of those that they represent, the Lord brings that same condemnation on them. That's why it says there in Romans 5, 12, by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men. Can you see here, even in reading this, how thankful we are that ultimately God had that representative in the, in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because had it been left up to men, there would be no salvation. In fact, the writer of the Hebrews said that, that these as types and pictures had to fail. They had to die. They were just types and pictures until Christ should come and fulfill all things. And so, as goes the head, as goes the representative, so go the people. Another clear example of representation in Scripture is the battle between David and Goliath. The Lord purposed all these things. Came down to Goliath, putting out that challenge. Bring me a man, someone to, to stand and fight for you, and if, if he win then we become your servants. If I win, then they become our servants. That's a picture of representation. David representing the Lord Jesus Christ and slaying the giant. This is the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness and defeated Satan, sin, and the world for the salvation of his people. But he says all that to bring back again in verse 8, how he is purposed to hollow this house, this temple that Solomon has built because of what it typified. He says, and at this house, and notice, which is high. It doesn't mean that it was just up on a high place, but highly exalted in what it represented in the person of Christ. Everyone that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss. Now he's talking there about the day when because of Israel's idolatry, God taking them into judgment, that he would raise up a nation to come and destroy this very house that was high to his glory. And they shall say, why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and to this house? I find it interesting that we have here already foretold what would happen to the children of Israel. Predetermined. Didn't catch God by surprise, but again, these things had to be in order to open the way for the true Savior, 
the true redeemer, the true king, the true representative, the person of Christ. But if any should ask why God would take and destroy that house, they shall answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon other gods, and have worshipped them and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. You have people today preaching up their morality. <clears throat> they preach up man's free will. And they believe that somehow they're doing God a service. And yet they're under the same condemnation as what we're reading about here. Because by preaching up works, you're actually preaching up other gods. And by preaching up man's will, God has no rivals. When you say that God would like to do something, but alas, man has to let him, you're preaching another God. That's not the God of the Bible. And so many today, even in their places of worship, even many that call themselves Christian, and yet they see their salvation as being in part what they've done and in part what Christ has done, that's not hollowing God's name. Everything even in this temple was by way of representation. It wasn't everybody running into that temple and offering their worship. No, it was through a representative. It was through a priesthood. And again, how jealous is God of his son? Well, it's of no consequence for him to destroy sinners such as his glory and honor. So let that be a warning to any of us concerning who this God of Scripture is and how he hallows his name. I put down here three particular thoughts about how God's name is to be hallowed. The first is that God's name is hallowed in how he is to be worshipped. That's what we've been looking at. And when he says, I've hallowed this house, in verse 3, which thou hast built. How did he do that? But by the, the, the cloud of glory filling it. I know here it doesn't specifically mention that in verse 3. But again, if you go over to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, where we were just a little while ago, you'll see exactly how God hallowed his name. How it was visibly evident that God had purposed that this be a place where he would cause his glory to dwell. Notice in the chapter 7, verse 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, notice this, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. All those burnt offerings and sacrifices were a representation of Christ and his death that he should accomplish, whereby God would then be just and declare righteous that people. But apart from that, his glory would not be known. And we saw this already previously, verse 2, the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And we saw that last time, how many sacrifices were offered Again, a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you ask me, well, where does God's glory dwell? It, dwell? it dwells in his son. And who that son is and, and who, how he is the high priest and how his shed blood is what is, has brought satisfaction. And that's how it could be said that God had purposed to put his name there forever, there to grant his presence. 
we're not of those that think that there's got to be a lot of hoopla and carrying on in order to say we're worshiping God and everybody gets whooped up. Music and other things that modern religion uses to try to excite people, that's all flesh. Where are those, like we just read there in Second Chronicles 7, where they were so awestruck with the glory of the Lord descending his presence there where those sacrifices were being offered that all they could do was bow and say what a God he is and how merciful and good he is not to destroy us. And so, so long as these worship God in this way, his presence was there. That's an evidence of his presence. But as you continue to read through the Old Testament as time went on, and I will tell you, that's how you can tell where God has removed his presence even from congregations today that believe they're worshiping God. And yet there's no mention of Christ as the high priest or his sacrifice. There's no glory of God through his shed blood and his death, and they go on like nothing was. That's the evidence that God has removed his presence. Even as you read in Revelation of the seven churches, the removing of the candlestick. That candlestick is removed. That means the glory of the Lord, his presence is removed. Maybe people feel like his presence is there, but I'll tell you, if Christ is not being preached from Genesis to Revelation, run for your life. Because God has removed his presence. There's an interesting scripture in Ezekiel chapter 10. And this is a message just in and of itself. A lot of people think that Ezekiel is talking about some future earthly temple that's going to be rebuilt. But that's not only foolish, but blasphemous to think that when Christ came and fulfilled all of God's just requirements that through his shed blood that somehow now at the end of time there's going to be another temple rebuilt and a thousand year reign you hear people preaching about that's foolishness now when Christ came and again he came unto his own it says but his own received him not they were going about their temple worship, but the presence of God was not there. It had already been removed. And I believe this is what Ezekiel is writing about here in Ezekiel 10, forward looking. You can see in verse 15, and the cherubims were lifted up. This was the living creature that I saw by the river, Kabar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them, and when the Cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth. The same wheels also turned and not from beside them. This is all types and pictures of God's providence and how he was directing. And when they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also for the spirit of the living creature was in them. Now here's what I want you to see in verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. This was God removing his presence from the then temple because Ezekiel prophesied what would happen to Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Babylonians. He was foreseeing all this and it's described here as the, the very glory of the Lord departing from the threshold of the house, that means from off of this temple. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. This is God removing his hand from them. And when they went out, the wheels also were beside them and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. In other words, it was preparing to move. Now, as you continue to read on in Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 23, notice, the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood 
upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. So in other words, we see this cloud of glory slowly moving. A lot of people think, well, when God withdraws his blessing, it's immediate. No, there's a moving of the candlestick. That those that were there may not even perceive. And so afterwards, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea. You see, this is for Chaldea's Babylon. To them of the captivity. So he's seen this in a vision, what would take place. So the vision that I had seen went up from me, and I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had showed me. So he's prophesying that this glory of the Lord would be removed. And... Anything that I read from here through the rest of Scripture, you don't read where that glory of the Lord ever was put back into that temple as it was previously. Until, this is an interesting study in Scripture, there was a lifting of the glory of the Lord. There was silence for 400 years between Malachi and John the Baptist, 400 years of silence. Then what happens? Well, look at Malachi chapter 3. And this is where, when that temple of Zerubbabel, after the captivity was built, there's a description here of the glory of the Lord coming back to that temple. Because you have to realize that the temple into which Christ entered in his day, it was actually Zerubbabel's temple. It wasn't Solomon's. That was destroyed. But here in Malachi chapter 3, again, forward-looking to the coming of Christ, he, he, he was caused to prophesy, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Who was that messenger? That was John the Baptist. And he shall prepare the way before me, so this is God speaking, but he was Christ's forerunner. So you've got a clear prophecy here showing that that one to come was none other than God in the flesh. And the Lord whom ye seek, notice, shall suddenly come to his temple. This is where the glory of the Lord returned when, when Christ walked back into that temple. But they didn't perceive it. Some did. Simeon. When they brought the little baby Jesus for his circumcision the eighth day, he took that little babe in his arms and said, Now I can die. Behold, my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. That's pretty definitive. That, he said, Well, how did he know that? Reading the scriptures. He didn't know he was going to live to see it, but he did. He saw the glory of the Lord. Many didn't. But when Christ entered into that temple, that was the presence of the Lord coming into that temple, but they didn't perceive it. In fact, they questioned his authority when he cleansed the temple. Not just once, but twice. And they asked him by what authority he did those. They didn't perceive that this was the Lord. And so ultimately, See, this is the end of the story, just like what we're reading here. God said, you go off into idolatry, I'll remove my presence. And I'll destroy you. Christ removed his presence when he went to that cross. Because on the way up that hill, when they were weeping for him, he said, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. Because this house, your house has been left to you desolate. And that's the end of the story as far as this temple is concerned. People still enthralled with the temple, still thinking that somehow God's going to rebuild that thing over there in the land of Israel, but they're blind because Christ is God's temple. And through his death, through his sacrifice, he has forever redeemed the people. If you look in Ephesians chapter 3, you can see how this is described by the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 3. 
in verse 20 and 21. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Notice, unto him be glory, what? In the church of Christ Jesus. That's God's temple. The church referring to those elect that God gave him from all eternity, for whom he came and paid the sin debt. Unto him be, there's that word, glory. God's glory does not reside in a building. What's the first thing that people say is a, an evidence of God's blessing today when they can get enough money to, together to put up a multi-million dollar structure? And they dedicate it. That's not where God's presence is. In fact, far from it. But here it's clear, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Don't ever go back to look for another temple or building. No, it's in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen means so be it. You can see how God is hallowed and how he is to be worshipped. One other reference, I know our time's getting away, but in John chapter 4, remember when our Lord encountered a Samaritan woman? She was all about Jews worshiping in Jerusalem. And Samaritans, they worship on their mount. They were divided, just like different denominations today. But our Lord told her here in John 4, beginning with verse 20, in answer to her statement, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. He say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And notice what the Lord says. Jesus said unto her, A woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain where the Samaritans worshipped, nor yet at Jerusalem. People today still bent on getting back to that temple being built in Jerusalem. Worship the Father. He says, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know that what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, the seed was to come through that nation, the Jews. But the hour cometh, notice, and now is. He was getting her eyes off of earthly places of worship and traditions and, and temples. The, not, the hour now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeketh them such to worship him. When it says seeks, it doesn't mean he's hoping. It means he's finding. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. That's how God has purposed to hallow his name. Through the manner of worship. Now, coming back to our text, in verses 4 through 5, we see that God's name is hallowed and requiring absolute holiness. That's who he is. That's why Solomon and these others had to fail, because there's only one true holy one, holy one of Israel. That would be his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of these had to fail that his son should be manifest. And then the final way is God's name is hallowed in his judgments against false worship. Just because he doesn't exercise that judgment immediately doesn't mean he's not judging. There are a lot of dead men walking today where that glory has been removed and they haven't even perceived it. They're not even aware. They go about continuing to worship in their traditions and yet God is not there. I can't think of anything more fearful than to be about worshiping and yet not having the spirit of Christ in us to know that it's in him, it's in his sacrifice. Why would you want to hear anything else? Why would you want to come in any other way except for that you be a, an idolater and a rebel? And unless God gives eyes to see, that's men will die as they've lived. Hell is full of people, I'm certain, that are probably on the outward more moral than most of us sitting here. Because we know ourselves for what, who we are. 
we're sinners, but for the grace of God, but for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's where God's presence is. It's in his son. All right, we've got to leave it there. And I uh, pray the Lord will bless that to our hearing. Let's take our hymn books. One final hymn, 442. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer. 442. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming. Over the world victorious, power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. All right. We'll be dismissed until next time. Lord willing.